Waters presents On the Box. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Monday edition of On the Box. We have a very special program for you today. Ray is going to do an evangelistic Moroccan dance. <laughs> no, I was gonna. Have you seen that movie Up? We love Up. If you go up on up to my, if you go up to my office, oh, up, you will see uh, three pictures of uh, the couple in Up. Really? Yeah. I just on, did. On that's why I'm oh, asking. Oh, really? <laughs> I, hated, <laughs> I hated the beginning well, of okay. Up. okay. Yes, you cried. You have to cry. The beginning was just awful. It made me just cry. Kirk said it's a Every wonderful, time. funny movie. So I went and saw it. And it yeah, it's yeah. So Every sad. time. It tears me up the first ten minutes. But it's cartoon. I know. What are we crying about? It's because it's truth. It's, it's Ecclesiastes. Yeah, it is. And it's just, yeah, it it's is. very sad. So how was the weekend? It was there. Yeah, I had a great time. Saturday was great. Sunday was wonderful. It's now Monday. Moving on. Do you want to expand yes, on that Yes, I went at to all, a right? wonderful homeschooling conference and spoke to some wonderful people, some wonderful words, and we had a wonderful time. How was uh, fishing on Saturday? I didn't go. I was out at a conference oh, really? speaking. Yeah. So Scotty went by himself. Yeah. Uh, Chad didn't make it. He was up in the mountain somewhere, and Scotty was by himself. He had a really good time, had some good hecklers, and okay. I won't be there next week either because I'm at uh, San Antonio preaching. Oh, at that's the, right. Probably going to do open air at the Alamo. Really? What was the, what are the, what's the famous saying from the Alamo? I can't remember what it was. But Don't quit. Oh, well, that'll do. <laughs> Don't quit. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, remember the Alamo. That's it, yeah. So on Saturday. But that came after the Alamo. Okay. So it's Saturday, on Saturday when I'm at the San Antonio Independent Film Festival, I've got to remember the Alamo. Remember the Alamo. Yeah. Okay. Go there. Um, I had an opportunity to speak at the Men's Breakfast at Calvary Chapel Downey. Oh, good. Saturday morning. Went well. Had uh, anywhere from 100 to 120 guys there. What did you have for breakfast? Uh, something Spanish. You don't know what it was. Yeah. Danny, what was <laughs> it? Chorizo it was a pinto beans. Chorizo and eggs, pinto beans. Danny came. And he could still speak. Danny came. Yes. And tortillas. 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 They bought those tortillas oh. from downtown Los Angeles right before the conference. From right down before the breakfast. Downtown Los Angeles? That's what I heard. Rumor had it. They <laughs> were really good. Did you eat any? Yeah, I oh, did. Good. Yeah, they were really good. Good. And uh, <laughs> one of the guys who was there, his name's uh, uh, Leo. He came out to open air preach with me at Santa Monica. Good. And uh, Ryan Falquist, who helped us in the Origin in Schools project and the 180 project from Indiana. Mm -hmm. He's out here for a conference, and so he came and joined me for open-air preaching out is on he gonna come Is he going to come and visit us? He's going to come visit us again tomorrow. Good. Uh, well, might great. sneak out and do a little preaching tomorrow, maybe. Good, yeah. If you're yeah. ever in the uh, Los Angeles area, come and visit us. We love having people in on the box. That's right. And uh, one of the vendors out there, Third Street Promenade, uh, I think there was something demonic going on with this guy. No, little, not in Third Street. Little Asian character. And as uh, soon as I opened my mouth, as soon as I started to read uh, from the Bible, he just came unglued and uh, was yelling and screaming, came up in my face like that. He and did? Yeah, he did. He did. So what then was he, he there for? he screamed in my ear. What he was, was a vendor. He, was, he had a permanent little... Oh, yeah, well, you've got the right to be there as much as he has, yeah. and he should be thankful. Yeah, and I, I assured him of that. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> uh, we don't want to waste sure any time today. We do have a very special guest with us today. Certainly it do. is a special show because the entire program is going to be focused on homeschooling. We've got uh, Rick Boyer with us today, and we will go over to the dean's office to take a look at him in a moment. We also have uh, Pete Gill and his son, Peter Joshua. Peter Joshua is apparently a shy young man. It's one of us. Who is a trained <laughs> classical guitarist. I heard him classicking. You did? Yes, and it was, was just it beautiful. Was it classical? Uh, yeah, it was beautiful. It was yeah. like, have you ever heard classical gas? That brr, brr, I can't play it. Classical gas? It was like gas. that, but it was, that's a famous song, classical Cl gas. Classical gas? Very famous. It was kind of, at the beginning was like that, but it was sanctified. Google it. It, did, it didn't have anything to do with the Spanish breakfast I had yesterday morning? It could have. Okay. So but uh, Peter's also attending the Expositors up. Seminary, which is the online version of the Master's Seminary, probably one of the best schools in the world. And uh, and we were hoping he would have his guitar here today so he could serenade us and up viewership, but he doesn't have it with him. So. Yeah, I would have sent the ratings through the roof. Through the roof, both of them, both ratings. <laughs> yeah. All right, I have been encouraged not to waste any time since I have no idea how much time we have left. Oh, no! What are we going to do with the clock? <laughs> zero, what are we going to do? I would say estimating 4.25 is gone. I would, that's what I'd estimate. Now it's I'm going to watch more. the regular clock for a change. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that'll do. Yeah, okay. it's, uh, it's, yeah it's, even if it's wrong. Anyways, we do have with us uh, Rick Boyer. Rick Boyer and his wife Marilyn are among the earlier uh, trailblazers of the homeschool movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am reading. I'm going right off I've the website. I've got a special question to ask him about that, too. Oh, that's where the show gets interesting. 
uh, building on their experience in training their own 14 children. That's amazing. That is amazing. Praise the Lord. That's, that's like Duggar Jr. That's a quiverful. A quiverful. That's a big mm -hmm. old quiver. They run out of names. No, I don't think so. If the Duggars could do 20 names. Well, Jays, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll ask him about the names of the kids. Yeah, my grandchild. We'll have, you know what we'll do? We'll ask him all the names and all the birth dates. Oh, that's, that's See, interesting. Uh, how much when Rachel we was get having her children, the last one I said to, suggested to call the baby nausea. Baby, no <laughs> baby yeah. nausea. Yeah, his nausea. Okay. All right, continuing on. Uh, Rick and Marilyn have uh, written several books, uh, very popular books on homeschooling, Christian parenting, and national reformation. The Boyers are also the creators of the Character Concepts Homeschool Curriculum. Uh, Rick's books include Home, Educating with Confidence, Take Back the Land, which is a conference you spoke at, yeah. and we're going to be talking about uh, that at length in a little while, uh, The Socialization Trap, and The Hands-On Dad. We want to welcome Rick Boyer! Hi, guys. <laughs> All right, settle down. <laughs> settle down, Rick. Rick, how are you, sir? I'm well. How are you? Good. Hey, t uh, before we get into uh, all of our questions, and we have several of them, and and uh, and I'm very excited about this because we've been a homeschool family for 15 years. We're in our last 15 semester. 15 years? 15 years. Wow, that's We're great. We're in our last semester with our last child. Kind of a bittersweet moment, mm. uh, but uh, homeschooling has been one of the best decisions we've ever made oh, yes. for our family. But uh, Rick, tell us a little bit about the uh, conference this weekend. And, uh, and you know what? Well, let's just start with that. We were going to finish the show with this, but we'll start with this. Tell us about the Take Back the Land conference, since that's where Ray spoke. Well, to start out with, we had a really nutty guy with a beard who came in and talked about evangelism. And uh, one of the most common comments we got on our evaluation forms when we asked what people liked about the conference was uh, Ray Comfort. Got to have Ray Comfort. So that was a big plus. He's been one of my heroes for a long time. Wow. So I was so excited Heroes to get Ray there. And it was great. I got to hear two new talks that I hadn't heard before. Um, the conference is based on the theme that we believe God is turning the hearts of the fathers to the children in our day as in Malachi. And we believe that this is the spear point of revival. So we're just so excited to, uh, to be presenting this conference for moms and dads and the young people to be coming out and to be responding and deciding, hey, yeah, we can do something about the condition of the culture war. We have the power of God on our side, and all we need to do is get busy. So that's basically what this is about. Now, how often do you do the conference? This was our very first one. Whoa! Yes, girl. indeed. The inaugural conference. How often do you plan to do the conference? As often as God enables us. It depends a lot on the um, homeschooling organizations in the different states because we have to work hand in hand with them to be able to sure. get the word out to the right people. Now, uh, could they find uh, information Oops. about upcoming Oops. conferences at your website? Absolutely. Yeah. And we that got... is thelearningparent.com? Uh, yes, but we also have a new oh, website, okay. takebacktheland.com. Okay, very good. So they can, either way, they can reach us, yeah. All right, so thelearningparent.com or takebacktheland.com. Now, right. Ray, do you want to get us started with the questions? You said you had a very interesting yes. question. Yes. Have you seen up? No, yep. that wasn't the question. Uh, the question is, how was it at the beginning of homeschooling? Tell us about some of your, yeah, well, I didn't read that. <laughs> Tell us about some of your experiences. My daughter, Rachel, told me to ask you that because she knows the inside story. Yes. Well, early on... A lot of people don't realize it because the homeschooling movement is over 30 years old now. We were the first in our area to homeschool our kids. And in fact, I thought I invented it for a while because I hadn't <laughs> heard of anybody else doing it. But the next year, we began to hear about people, uh, just you know, small groups of people around the country starting to homeschool their kids. Because nobody was doing it, the compulsory attendance laws had not been sensitized to homeschoolers. And so a lot of people had trouble with the law over it. And we were among those. After about two or three years of homeschooling, we evidently got reported by a neighbor who saw our kids out playing during school hours, and we got a visit from a gentleman called a truant officer. Uh, we ended up in court, and we managed to finish out that school year by making an agreement with a Christian school to let my wife go up there and teach her own kids in her own classroom, and that wow. work was perfectly legal. The next school year, 1982-83, we, along with many other parents in our home state of Virginia, were over in Richmond lobbying the state legislature to sensitize the uh, compulsory attendance laws to homeschoolers. But during that year, while we were working on this, 
we still continue to keep our kids at home, even though the state of Virginia had threatened to charge us with child in need of services, which means they can take your children away from you. And if that happens, it's very hard to ever get them back. So we were typically intimidated young parents. And we trained our boys who were school age, or the two oldest were school age. The third was uh, big enough, he looked to be school age. So we kept him indoors at all times during school hours. And we trained them in a little fire drill. If somebody comes to the door, mom or dad will answer the door. You, Ricky, Timmy, Nathan, you, when you hear the doorbell ring, you will run to your room. You will get under your bed, and you will not move a muscle or make a sound until mom or dad calls wow. the all clear. And that's how we got to live in uh, the free country of the United States for uh, the remainder of that school year. But we were successful, and uh, after that school year had passed, the state legislature had freed up the compulsory attendance law. It was signed into law by the governor in the summer of 84, and praise the Lord, we had uh, won a battle that many parents still had to fight across the country. Wow, that is amazing. Uh, to, to think that here in the United States, telling your children, yeah. go hide under your bed if yes. someone knocks on the door. That's frightening. I think those days are coming back again, but that's a yeah. topic for another show. Yeah. So uh, how is it that you and Marilyn decided to homeschool your, your children? Was this something you had decided before your children were born, uh, or were they ever in public school? No, they were not ever in public school. We'd sent our two oldest boys to a uh, good preschool operated by our church and we we're very pleased with it because they didn't cram academics they're very spiritually oriented and we like the priorities that they put on spiritual things but our homeschooling experience began as a convenience and grew into a conviction because during that year preschool my wife came to me one evening and she said don't you think I could teach Ricky that was our oldest kindergarten at home next year well, I never heard of homeschooling, so I was a little shocked, and I said, well, yeah, you could, but why would you want to do that? Mm. And she explained, well, you know, we've got the uh, two older boys in preschool this year, three half days a week, but it's an hour-round trip to the church, and so we have to pack the two younger boys, Nathan and Joshua, into the back seat of the car, and we have to make that round trip twice a day so the boys can have half a day of preschool. Well, next year it'll be kindergarten for Ricky, so it'll be uh, five half days, of kindergarten and we're gonna have to make that round trip strap the babies in and is it really worth it if I can do it at home so I said well yeah I mean wh why not it's only for kindergarten right she said yeah it's only for kindergarten so I went to the headmaster of the school and talked to him and he said oh yeah sure it's only for kindergarten right and I said yeah it's only for kindergarten and so um, 32 years later we're still homeschooling <laughs> it grew into a conviction Wow now it's a challenge to homeschool one child um, we did three. Uh, Rachel's doing five, five right? Yes. Uh, I yes. don't know. Are all five being schooled? Or yes, all five. All five, yes. okay. So one through five. And that's I'm it. delighted about that. Yeah. I can't tell you how delighted I am. It's nothing tell like us a, how delighted you are. Well, it's nothing like a school shooting to make you appreciate homeschooling. Amen. Yeah. No, you know what? I mean, it's, that, that's not to be flipped, but yeah. I, I served as a gang investigator uh, you know, when I was on the sheriff's department, and I spent a lot of times on the local high schools, and the last place I wanted to send my darling daughters was oh, yeah. to go feed them to the wolves on a high school campus. That's I so knew true. too much about the school system to, in good conscience, be able to send my children to the public schools. I went to a school, I've been to a number of schools to speak, and I went to a school to speak at their, a Christian gathering, and I could not believe the filth I had to walk through just to get to the school. This was years ago. It's far worse now. And it, it's a, I mean, as far as language, the language, way the kids are talking, the, everything, dressing. Everything is just the world in, in its worst state. So yeah. to send, uh, I'm so delighted that my grandchildren have turned out the way they're turning out, and it's a lot of it's due to homeschooling. Yeah, amen. So as challenging as it is to, uh, to homeschool a small quiverful of children, how'd you guys do it with 14? Well, I'm fortunate to have probably the most organized wife in the world. Amen. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she... Um, the way she would operate by treating the kids as individuals and working with them in the in the best way for them she had a big advantage when you've got 25 kids in a classroom you have to treat them as if they're all average but no kids average everybody has their individual strengths weaknesses preferences personalities spiritual gifts and all that so my wife 
taught the kids as individuals. And she based this on Proverbs 22, 6. We're all familiar with that verse. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. But we usually emphasize the way he should go, and he won't depart. And we, we leave out that little word, he. We don't put any emphasis on that. But it doesn't say in the way they should go. It says in the way he should go. So by individualizing their instruction, the children who need less supervision for a given subject can spare mom's time for the kids that need more supervision in another subject. And so by individualizing the instruction, she was able to do that. And I, I should add, my wife does not have any special, special. That's a any good word. Special, I like it. Yeah, it's uh, New Zealand, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You don't know about New Zealand. It's a suburb of Australia. I hear. Ooh! But, <laughs> whoa! Those are almost fight sorry. words, aren't they? Ray? Mm -hmm. uh, I could resist. <laughs> Uh, she does not have any special credentials as a teacher. Neither of us ever finished college, but uh, she's just a great natural teacher, a great mom, a wonderful wife, and she has been able to just be orderly with it. Another thing, too, is when kids get individualized instruction, it doesn't take nearly as much time as it does in a school. My wife very seldom spent more than two hours a day in the organized or structured part of her homeschooling, but our kids did things, went places, read books, met people, and so they been able to get a very nice education without all the fault or all that you'd have when you age segregate kids, put them all together, and try to treat them as if they're all average. Now, Rick, you made a really good point about uh, Marilyn and yourself not being credentialed teachers. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I never graduated from college. Maria had a, a two-year office administration degree, but none of us were credentialed. Neither one of us are credentialed mm -hmm. as teachers. And that was one of the things that held us back at first. You know, are we, quote-unquote, qualified uh, to teach our kids, well, you know, as we look through the Word of God, we had the best possible credentials to teach our kids. We are their parents. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, you love them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. and you want the best for them. So how, how has homeschooling changed over the last 30 years since you were there at the infancy and fought all the good fights? What's, what's the state of homeschooling today? One big change is that you don't go to jail for it anymore, yeah. for which we are all very thankful. Amen. Uh, another big change is that it's a whole lot easier to get hold of materials, the tools you need to work with your kids as far as textbooks and videos and that sort of stuff. It's almost too easy. There's so much available, it's hard to make your choices. Uh, my advice to homeschool parents is keep it simple. Start out simple and uh, develop your educational program as you learn how your kids learn, what their interests are, what their needs are, and so on. An important change in the homeschooling movement is that spiritually it's gotten watered down. In the early mm. days, there was a net of regulation through the compulsory attendance laws, and only those who were really dedicated would fight the system enough to, uh, to buck the trend, buck the law in some cases, and homeschool their kids. And so it was only the most dedicated parents, at least among the Christians, who were homeschooling. Nowadays, it's legal everywhere. It's easy most places. And so we are no longer filtering out people who are less committed. You have a lot of people coming out to our homeschool conventions and speaking engagements who do not do it as a convictional matter. That doesn't bother me. It wasn't a conviction with, with us either in the beginning. It started out as a convenience and grew into a conviction. So we have less convicted parents to deal with. We have a cooler spiritual temperature overall, but that's fine with me. Just bring these people to the conventions and the seminars. Let us old fossils work their heads <laughs> over a little bit, and we'll explain to them why this should be a conviction and why they should really dedicate themselves to it and make it work. Now, uh, initially, and certainly uh, through our phase of homeschooling, Predominantly, it's been Christians uh, who have been homeschooling their children. But, uh, Rick, have you seen that there are now more unbelievers homeschooling their kids than before? There are far more than there used to be because the government schools educate the bulk of the children in this country, and they're not getting better. They only get worse. And so many people who have no interest in the gospel, no interest in spiritual things at all, are homeschooling their kids just because the, the movement, which has largely been dominated by Christians up to this point, has demonstrated this system works. And people who love their kids, whether they love the Lord or not, are taking advantage of that. The spelling bees often have got homeschooling kids right up front. That's right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yes. and, and you, meant, you mentioned, Rick, that uh, people are seeing that homeschooling works. Yeah. Uh, do you have any data, any information that shows how homeschooling kids are faring in the secular college and university world? 
Well, I've only got anecdotal evidence myself uh, based on what I've seen. I've seen plenty that I'm sold on it and remain sold on it. But there is the National Home Education Research Institute. N-H-E-R-I dot org, where people can get all kinds of great, solidly documented scientific evidence that shows that homeschooling works. But now Ray just referenced something that's, that's anecdotal but very powerful, and that's the fact that these national academic competitions, like the spelling bee, the geography bee, the history contest, they've always got, seems, a homeschool kid in the top three or four placers, and homeschoolers are only about 3% of the school age population. So that says a lot right there. Yeah, very true. And, uh, you know, anecdotally for myself, you know, our kids are a little older than the Zwayne's kids. Uh, two of our daughters, uh, we homeschooled. Uh, we took them out of uh, public schools in, in early elementary school age and homeschooled them all the way through um, high school. And they went on to university to earn their uh, bachelor's degrees. Wow. And my middle daughter's going on to earn her master's. And, and uh, one of the w most wonderful things about that is that much of the time our dinner conversations uh, when they were in college centered around the uh, secular humanism that was being spewed from the professors at the college and, and they weren't they weren't coming to me with lots of questions about whether or not what they were hearing was true. They, they just couldn't wait to come and tell me, Dad, you wouldn't believe what these teachers are teaching yeah. on the campus and how anti-Christian they were. They were they were so well grounded in, in their faith and their understanding of God's word because of homeschooling, they were prepared uh, to discern truth from error when they went to the college. And that's a sign of Christian maturity. Amen. Amen. Uh, all right. Rick, one of the big questions, big objections we get from inside and outside the church as homeschoolers is the question about socialization. Hmm. Talk about that for a minute. Well, the first book that I wrote was called The Socialization Trap. And that title refers to the trap that parents fall into when they hear this constant question, which is still with us 30 years into the movement. What about socialization? I always just want to scream, look, I'm not a socialist. I don't worry about it, okay? <laughs> but uh, it's a legitimate question because people just don't know. Here's the facts, okay, from science and from scripture, there's nothing more unnatural for a kid to grow up in than an age-segregated social group. And the church has fallen into the socialization trap. We're age grading everything. We're expecting young people to grow to maturity when we group them unto themselves and separate them from all the mature social and spiritual models that we have around them in our churches. So the socialization traps theme was, hey, get your kids out of age segregation. Expose them to the people who are already doing the things that they themselves are going to be called upon to do as adults and let them grow up. Now, we know from American history that people used to grow up in this country long before they do now. Right. John Quincy Adams is a great example. His father was a president and a diplomat, and young John Quincy traveled with him a lot in his early years. He spent a lot of time away from home with his dad traveling to other countries, and he grew up. He took part in uh, adult things. He spent his time with mature and responsible adults rather than people his own age, and he became an adult. When he was eight years old, he was drilling with a Massachusetts militia with his musket on his shoulder during the War of Independence. When he was 11 years old, he accompanied his father as his personal secretary when the senior John Adams was envoy to uh, the Netherlands. At 14, John Quincy got a congressional appointment as secretary to the American envoy to Russia. And so here's this 14-year-old kid given an appointment by Congress to go to a foreign country and help represent American interests. Wow. And that's not that uncommon in his time. Wow, that's a, that is amazing. Very and, you know, and uh, when we were asked that question over the years about socialization. Uh, Can you just define it for us dummies? What it, specifically, what are they saying? Your kids are growing up in an unreal they're, environment. Yeah, exactly. They're, not, they're, 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 not. they're saying you're, you're sequestering your children, you're, you're putting your children in a bubble, they're, they're not going to understand what the real world is like because they're not out there living among the real world. They're not socializing, they're not becoming part of the society like the other kids are in uh, the public school system. And, and my first answer was, I don't want want my child yes. socialized. I don't want my child uh, bringing home the things of the world. I want my children to be set apart as holy. They have to live in the world, but they do not have to be of the world. And, and so much of public education now is, is so much less about reading, writing, and arithmetic, but more about social 
engineering, social agendas, mm -hmm. and, and what have you. And that's one of the reasons why we pulled our kids out of public school, because even in the second, third, fourth grade, they were learning things socially that we didn't want our seven, eight, nine-year-old daughters to learn. And they're learning them from other kids That's right. of the their Bible own said, age. To be innocent towards that which is evil, That's right. Scripture says. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right, so what kind of attacks, what kind of attacks are going on presently uh, against uh, homeschooling and homeschoolers, Rick? Well, it's a lot sneakier now, Tony. It used to be direct attacks through the compulsory attendance law situation. But today, the UN is actually trying to destroy families all over the world with this convention, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And Homeschool Legal Defense Association, which is a tremendous blessing, it's a tax exempt corporation, I don't know if they're a corporation, not their tax exempt organization in Northern Virginia, headed by a friend of mine, Mike Ferris. And they are fighting to get a constitutional amendment passed that will protect parental rights because if we sign on, if America signs on to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, all parental rights will be stripped away. The children will be able to decide whether they want to go to church or not, whether they want to go to school or not, where they want to go to school, who they want to live with, and it's just going to be absolute anarchy and chaos. Yeah. It's yeah. exactly the opposite of scripture. There are also attacks coming through overzealous social workers who invade homes claiming they have a right to be there without a search warrant. A number of different things uh, are being done. There are things coming through the state legislatures all the time that will affect homeschooling and parental rights and family values from, uh, from the back door. So anything that affects family values is a potential attack on homeschoolers. So we no longer just have to be concerned about compulsory attendance laws. We have to be watching on all sides for other things that will affect us. All right. And HSLDA yeah. is an outstanding organization. Uh, we've been uh, members of HSLDA uh, for about 15 years now, and uh, they are doing great work to defend the rights of homeschoolers. Rick, do you have a newsletter people could sign up for, something that will keep them informed? If they will go to our website, thelearningparent.com, they can be put on our email list and they will get our articles. They'll be notified when we have new blog postings. They'll get some special offers of our materials and so forth. All right. And we're about, just about out of time, but uh, I would hazard a guess that there might be uh, some folks out there watching uh, who are not homeschooling their children but are considering it in about a minute or so. Can you give a word of encouragement to those folks? You know, the first thing you ought to do is read a book by a man named John Taylor Gatto, G-A-T-T-O. You can find it online easily. He taught for 30 years in the public schools of New York City, and he hated every minute of it. And he wrote a book exposing the processes, not just the curriculum, not just the people that your kids uh, have to rub shoulders with in a given school, but the processes that dumb us down and make us not think for ourselves, but make us accept what we're told by anybody in authority that teaches us rather not to think than how to think. So that would be the first thing I would do. Secondly, search the scriptures and see if you don't find conviction there that you need to be the primary educators of your children. Because as far as I can find in the Bible, there is no command given to teach children except given to the parents, or in some, case, in some cases, the parents and the grandparents. You teach these things to your children and your children's children. That doesn't mean they shouldn't learn from others, but that means you should be their primary teacher teachers. So I would, I would exhort you to do those two things. Then find, you can find online, your state's Christian homeschooling support organization, and that will be a great help to you. They've got all kinds of resources, and we're always happy to hear from you at The Learning Parent if you'd like to email us. All right. Outstanding. Rick? Rick, just want to thank you so much for coming here. It's been very special, and uh, thank you. That's a new word. I got to sure use it. Sure, word. All right. You know what? I promised someone we would show a picture today, mm. and uh, someone posted this on my Facebook wall. Uh, you got it? You got it, Danny? Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Here it is. Coming. <laughs> what is that? It's a cat with, I it guess, a real life mustache. It looks like a cross between Kiss and the Nazi. <laughs> Anyways, they captured it, Tony Meowno. <laughs> Tony Meowno. That's just yeah. So that was fun. that was uh, posted on my wall by uh, by my friend uh, Jen Marshall, and I, I asked, please, if that's your cat, please don't name the cat Tony Meowno. So, anyways. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Hey, we want to again. We want to thank uh, Rick Boyer for being with us. Very informative. You're going to want to uh, watch the show over again. I am sure. Mm -hmm. Let your friends know. Uh, those who are homeschooling and uh, those who maybe are, are considering homeschooling, I think they'll be very encouraged by today's program. Until tomorrow, be encouraged, strengthened, and unafraid. Proclaim the gospel. Living Waters presents On the Box.